Welcome to Be Still My Soul. Today is a beautiful day. We have full house and we have a very special guest with us today. Noemi, welcome. Noemi hails all the way from Fort Worth, Texas. So this show is now international and we give God all the glory. We're also being joined by our beautiful sisters, Marky Avila and Rodriguez Fuller, Marie Munoz, and myself, Pauline Romero. And today, we'll be looking at Syrup, chapter 27. But before we get started, we invite you, our viewers and listeners, to join us now for our opening prayers. Lord, thank you for life. Thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for your mercies, your love, your compassion, your forgiveness, Lord. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of your glory. But can any human be perfect? No. We battle with the sins of the flesh. And so we ask, Lord, for you to strengthen us, help us to strive to be holy people so that when we are tempted with things of the flesh, we will instead reach for you and try to please you and act in the spirit. This is not easy. This is the battle of every human being. And so we call upon you, Lord, at all times, and we ask you to strengthen us strengthen our faith and we ask lord that you send the holy spirit to be with us right now mother mary please join us and help us during this show intercede for us mother mary so that whatever is god's words we will speak with love at all times oh holy spirit soul of our souls we worship and adore you enlighten and guide strengthen and console us tell us what we ought to do and command us to do it we promise to be submissive in everything you permit to happen to us only show us what is your will amen heavenly father you have given us the model of life in the holy family of nazareth Help us, O oh loving Father, to make our family another Nazareth, where love, peace, and joy will reign. May it be deeply contemplative, intensely Eucharistic, revived with joy. Help us to stay together in joy and sorrow in family prayer. Teach us to see Jesus in the members of our families, especially in their distressing disguise. May the Eucharistic heart of Jesus make our hearts humble like his and help us to carry out our family duties in a holy way. May we love one another as God loves each of us more and more each day and forgive each other's faults as you forgive our sins. Help us, O loving Father, to take whatever you give and give whatever you take with a big smile. Immaculate Heart of Mary, Cause of our joy, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Holy Guardian Angels, be always with us. Guide and protect us. Amen. May our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. And we are also on Facebook and YouTube. And can you just tell us a little bit about that social media aspect of Be Still My Soul? Thank you, Pauline. We invite you at this time, viewers, to please join us on Facebook. Go to Guadalupe Media on Facebook page. 
And I scroll down and you will see uh, Be Still My Soul being aired live. And you can feel free to join us and comment on us. Um, read the scripture along with us. And just for joining in, we have a special gift for you, a mug from Guadalupe Media. And we ask you to pick it up at two and a half miles, Northern Highway at the Divine Mercy Church. You can ask for Miss Marie Williams. And Marie, we just want to ask you to say a little bit about Guadalupe Media and the works that we're doing here in Belize. It's definitely a privilege to be on the show with you ladies. I've been having a blast since we started and um, I'm just enjoying the journey, um, traveling to the different sites. And so I'm thankful for um, this opportunity. Here at Guadalupe Media, our work is really evangelism through the media. And so we share on our holy family and the life that we live because he has called us to evangelize. And so there are so many people who have sold into Guadalupe Media and it is our turn to carry the baton. The work continues. Thank you, Mary. And if you'd like to assist in any way, you can contact Marie privately or Anne, and they will tell you how you can assist Guadalupe Media. Thank you so much. And today we are looking at Sirach chapter 27. And you know, it seems that we have just been on our ladies' cases lately. <laughs> But don't think the men are exempt from what Ben Syrah will have to say. I'm not sure what he'll say today, but I'm sure his words will be powerful and he will be talking to every single one of us. And so we now go to Anne for Sirach 27. Chapter 27, verse 1. For the sake of profit, many sin, and the struggle for wealth blinds the eyes. A stick will be driven between fitted stones. Sin will be wedged in between buying and selling. Unless one holds fast to the fear of the Lord, with sudden swiftness will one's house be thrown down. When a sieve is shaken, the husks appear. So do people's faults when they speak. The furnace tests the potter's vessels. The test of a person is in conversation. The fruit of a tree shows the care it has had. So speech discloses the bent of a person's heart. Praise no man before he speaks, for it is then that men are tested. If you strive after justice, you will attain it and put it on like a splendid robe. Birds nest with their own kind, and fidelity comes to those who live by it. As a lion crouches in wait for prey, so do sins for evildoers. Ever wise are the discourse of a devout are the discourses of the devout, but the godless man, like the moon, is inconsistent. Limit the time you spend among fools, but frequent the company of thoughtful men. The conversation of fools is hateful. Their laughter is coarse and ruckus. No one can bear those who swear all the time. Their quarrels make you cover your ears. Blood is split when proud men quarrel and their insults are painful to the air. He who betrays a secret is no longer trusted. He will no longer find reliable friends. Love your friend and be loyal. If you have revealed his secrets, go with him no longer. It is like having lost some of your relatives. His friendship to you has died. Like a bird released from your hand, you have let your friend go and cannot recapture him. Do not go after him, for he is far away, 
and has escaped like a gazelle from a snare. For a wound can be bandaged and an insult forgiven, but whoever betrays secrets does hopeless damage. Whoever has shifty eyes plots mischief, and those who know him will keep their distance. In your presence, he uses honeyed talk and admires your works, but later he changes his tone and twists the words to your ruin. I hated many things, but not as much as him, and the Lord hates him as well. Whoever throws a stone straight up throws it on his own head, and a treacherous blow opens up many wounds. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and whoever sets a snare will be caught in it. <clears throat> if a person does evil, it will roll back upon him, and he will not know where it came from. Mockery and abuse issue from the proud, but vengeance lies in wait from them like a lion. Those who rejoice in the fall of the godly will be caught in a snare, and pain will consume them before their death. Anger and wrath, these also are abominations, yet a sinner holds on to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks to be to God. We now invite you to go back and prayerfully read Sirach chapter 27. We will do the same. And you will find the Bible reading scrolling on the screen if you don't have access to a Bible right now. So we invite you to do that at this time.
Welcome back to Be Still My Soul. Today we're looking at Sirach chapter 27 and Anne is just ready to go. Right, Anne? Ready to go. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, I chose um, verse 4. I like to, where it says, When a sieve is shaken, the husks appear. And so do people's fault when they speak. And then it goes on to say that we're to praise no one before they speak in verse 7. For it is then that people are tested. That really reminds me of the Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, when Jesus said, a similar thing. He said, Oh, generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? He was referring to the Pharisees. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. But an evil man, out of the evil treasures of his heart, bring forth evil things. But I say to you, every idle word that a man speak, he shall give account for on the day of judgment. So um, it, it got me to thinking that if we get judged by what we speak, then we have to ask ourselves, what is the source? And then Jesus answered that question in Matthew chapter 12, that it's our heart. And how do we get goodness into our heart so that we can have good things to speak and good intentions to share with others? And I think the answer is by reading the word. Because we get good ideas about life from the word of God. We get life itself from the word of God. We get love from our Heavenly Father by reading the Word of God because we enter into our relationship with Him and we become um, close to Him through reading His Word because we get to know Him. And then when we get to know our Heavenly Father who is the source of love, then we feel loved. And if you even have the evil in your heart, the love from the Heavenly Father is such a cleansing power that it will heal your hurts, it will heal your pains, it will heal your anger, it heals many things. So I think it's the cure to having um, evil in our hearts. And as humans, we all get angry. We all get um, occasions where we can sin we fall into these traps where we can sin. So it's very important for us to read the word as often as possible since we will be judged by what comes out of our mouth, therefore what is in our hearts. And I, I don't know, um, I mean, I didn't look for the scripture, but I know that there is also a scripture in the Bible that tells us that our eyes and our ears are the windows to our souls. My mother always used to tell me that, and a pastor always told me that too. So I didn't find that scripture, but even if that is so, that means that we need to watch what we, we look at, you know, like monitor and, um, and really, um, carefully choose what to watch, what to listen to, even music. Um, I can tell you that after I became a Christian, certain music I had no desire to listen to any longer. And I was very young when I became a Christian, born again Christian, that I said willingly of my own self, I want to devote myself to walking um, in a Christian lifestyle. So... Um, I was listening to the usual regular teenage music, the dance hall and everything. And some of them are very um, derogatory, especially to women, you know. And suddenly, like, it was as if a light bulb went off in my head that as soon as I 
became born again, the desire to listen to those music just fell away. As a matter of fact, when I hear it, it just disturbs me and I don't want to hear it. I don't want to listen to certain things, anything with um, certain language. If I'm passing or driving down the street and I hear it booming somewhere, it just, you know, it really annoys me and I don't want to hear any of that because it disturbs my soul, literally disturbs my spirit. And that makes me, that makes me think that those things are mediums and that they are ways to, for the enemy to access our spirit and to disturb our souls. And likewise, even certain movies, certain things that we watch on television, you know, even the news to a point, and to, I mean, I'm not trying to discourage anybody from watching the news, but, you know, there just comes a point in time where some of the things and the ways that the news is portrayed, um, they need to have a filter of some sort sometimes, I think, in the way that things are done, because it just blackens your soul when you hear it, and it just makes me feel so sad and maybe even depressed for a minute or two when I feel like I have to, you know, just go and pray that off of me. And usually I pray for the victim and that would help me to feel better. And I would feel like at least, you know, listening to that, at least I wasn't listening as somebody who wanted to be entertained by somebody else's sorrow or misery but more as somebody who can help at least with a prayer, you know? So um, that's why I chose verse four, because I think that it is true that when you hear somebody speak, you can really tell a lot about that person. And we have to know that it starts from what goes into our eyes and ears. You know, what enters and affects our thoughts because we know that thoughts um, become actions. They become words and words become actions. So we have to direct our, our entire mind and our destiny and our future by putting good things in our minds and our thoughts. So that's my sharing for today. Thank you, Anne. Very important to remember that. And um, it's always here yeah, my grandmother say that to me. I was touched particularly by verse 6. A well-tended tree is shown by its fruits. So a man's feelings can be detected in what he says. And there are other verses that stood out. Many sin for love of gain. That was verse 1. Verse 15, blood is split when proud men quarrel and their insults are painful to the ear. And verse 30, grudge and wrath, there also are abominations in which sinful people excel. When I first read this chapter and I went back and asked the Holy Spirit to really guide me, what? What really stood out, the one thing that stood out was the word fruits. Because I'd heard it this morning already. We were reading the book of Leviticus, chapter 2. And I got the word first fruits. So to me, it's a reinforcement of the message I had already gotten this morning. And it's an important message because fruits are what are produced. If you look at a tree, like a mango tree, for example, right? You will see, hopefully, mangoes on that tree during certain times of the year, apple, whatever other fruits, oranges, bananas, right? And so we are trees too, and we bear fruits. And I think that the big question, the big challenge is, what are the fruits that we want to produce? Is it the fruits of the love of money, maybe? Where we sin for the love of gain? Where we desire riches? And we silence our conscience? 
when we're doing business? Is it the legacy where we lose some of our relatives? Where, as it says in verse 18, you don't even talk to your relatives, you deny them. Why oh, I'm not related to them people and you could be first cousins, right? Is it the legacy where you're always bickering because you're arrogant and you quarrel and you insult? What kind of legacy? To me, verse 6 is saying, what kind of legacy? What kind of fruits have you been bearing? And what do you want to leave this earth when you die? For sure, I know that my real fruits, my most important fruits, are my three children. And I give God glory and thanks for them every day. Family means the world to me. My children are not perfect, but I've really invested a lot of time and love in raising those three children. And I pray every day for them. I cover them with the precious blood of Jesus. And I said, Lord, Help my children to be good people. That no matter where they will go, they will exude God's love to others. And you know, I often, we have family gatherings every morning at our breakfast table, and I've shared this before. We read the word of God every day at our breakfast table. And we had that joy again this morning, but we had somebody visit who is very dear to all of us. And she's not my blood relative, but she's come to be a blood relative. And I believe that that's the kind of fruits that you want to set, that God is calling us as Christians to build. Not to make money your God, not to make power your God, right? To try to build back relationships that have been broken. We're all, we've all been hurt and we all need healing. There's even family relationships that may have been severed or broken and we need to heal those. And whilst you can choose who your family is, you can never choose who your blood will be because you cannot deny blood. I can not talk to a relative, but if I'm related to that person by, love, by, by blood, I cannot deny that person because the very blood of our ancestors run through the veins of each of us. And I teach my children that. And I tell them, someone can deny you, someone can reject you. If they rejected Jesus, what do you think you will go through? You will be rejected in your life too. But when you have that personal relationship with God, you will know that prayers are powerful and prayers can move mountains. And prayers will bring the healing. And if you're dealing with somebody who's arrogant, maybe even a spouse, just keep praying for that person. Keep praying for that relative, that mom, that dad, that sister, that brother, that cousin, that friend who may be arrogant. Because if you have two arrogant people, you won't get very far. Somebody has to humble himself or herself. And that's what I alluded to a few weeks ago in speaking about my mother. She has taught me by example that often Christians look foolish. We look stupid. Why are you allowed a person for walk all over you? For do you that? You're a fool. As a Christian, we will seem to be fools on this earth. But we have to answer to our Lord. And when we open our mouth, you better believe that we have to answer to God if stupidness 
and foolishness and corruption and evil and hate comes out of our mouth. We have to answer to God. And so when we open our mouths, we should always be prayerful and ask God, help me, Lord, to be wise in what I will share. Help me, Lord, to answer this person. Somebody might be going off around you and, yeah, 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 yeah. right? And just getting on your nerves because they don't know how to speak or they're quarreling or they're being arrogant, right? But ask God to help you to know how to answer because two arrogant people just keep clashing like the clash of the titans. And that's painful. Children, a lot of children have to be listening to that in their homes and that damages them. That hurts them. They can't deal with that. Many children have problems even focusing on their regular school work because they hear all this bickering in the home. They hear mom and dad quarreling or fighting and they don't know how to cope. They can't focus. They feel lost. And some of them are desperate and don't know what to do. So they turn to the outside world. That might teach them something that you don't want them to learn. They may turn to a friend who is doing drugs or living a lifestyle that is not pleasing to the Lord. So we really need to each look at ourselves. What are the fruits I am bearing right now? Are they pleasing to the Lord? Or do I need to put a check on my behavior? Do I need to put a check on the things that I'm pursuing? Maybe, you know, pursuing the wrong things. Because you want to make sure when you leave this earth, you leave this earth better than you found it. And you know, there are, in every family, there's brokenness. Some people call it generational curses. Some people call it an, a bad energy that gets passed from one generation to the next. And I am real with my children. I try to be open and honest with them. And I teach them sin can never be undone. You cannot undo a sin. Sin can be forgiven, but it cannot be undone. So watch your behavior. Watch what you say. Watch what you do. Look how you treat others. Because you cannot undo once you've done something. You can only seek forgiveness after that by humbling your heart. And so I thank God for my family. And I continue to pray for my family. I continue to pray that my family and generations of what have taken place, all the brokenness in my own family line. I keep praying for healing. And I keep talking to the ones that I do have access to influence that, you know, don't make the same mistakes your parents made. You do better. You make better choices, right? If you've already fallen, it's not the end of the earth. Just pick up the pieces and go on to a better life. But don't continue to make the same mistake over and over, over and over, over and over. So life ain't easy. But I believe today God is telling each one of us, take a hard look at your life and look at the fruits you're bearing and try to bear other fruits if you believe that they won't be pleasing to the Lord. And he can change those roots. God can do anything. He's a miracle worker. He's a way maker. All you have to do is believe. Even if your belief is just a pinch. 
a little dot the size of a mustard seed. He can change anything. You just need to get on your knees and pray and ask him to help you, to pour down the graces upon you that you need to make that difference, that you need to make a different step. Maybe instead of continuing that direction, you start going in a new direction. Put on that new wine skin. You cannot put new wine in old wine skin. And so as little children, as Catholics, we're baptized with holy water. And when we become older, we often have that baptism by fire, which is what Anne was referring to earlier. When we be begin to develop that personal relationship with God, that is where God is leading us right now. He's telling us to turn to him. Read the word every day and just surrender everything to him. And he will do everything and anything. We just have to believe. But that's my little sharing. We'll be right back with more on Be Still, My Soul. Welcome back to Be Still My Soul. We're looking at Syrup chapter 27 and we now go to Noemi for her sharing. Thank you, Pauline. Um, you know, there's always so much in the scriptures that we all want to just, you know, there's so much that comes to mind. But sometimes um, when I'm going to speak, um, the Lord always says clear your mind he's like clear your mind i'm like well lord should i prepare should i write down whatever um because i you know i had read this before and he said no i want you to be my vessel completely i don't want it to be anything from you i want it to be from me and I'm like, but that's scary because I'm a preparer. I like to plan things and I like to organize. So for me to just say, oh, okay, you take over, Lord. But, you know, um, in my past experience, um, it's usually exactly what needs to be said. Um, and so with so many things that... Um, we could talk about in this amazing scripture. Um, I, you know, um, the one that came to me more than anything, um, kind of piggyback on what Ann was talking about, um, is verse 11. And I think that's 11. Yeah, the, the conversation of the godly is always wise, but the fool changes like the moon. And then after that, 13 says, the talk of fools is offensive and their laughter is wantonly sinful. Their cursing and swearing makes one hair stand on end and their quarrels make others stop their ears. The strife of the proud leads to bloodshed and their abuse is grievous to hear. So it kind of combines what on talked about and what even what Pauline talked about you know your experiences with you know family members and relationship so the Lord took me to um talking about the tongue you know what is it about our tongue and so Proverbs 12 18 I'm going to read it there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And I think Ann mentioned a little bit about that. And it also talks about um, in Proverbs 18.21, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. So 
In Proverbs 12, 18, where it says, the tongue of the wise brings healing, I always think of what is it that I'm going to say or speak? You know, will it bring life to someone? Will it bring, you know, life or will it bring death? And I think we take our speech for granted as a human race. Um, we're quick to speak. Um, we don't normally, we, we don't really have um, any sense of what we're going to say. Does it matter? Um, we're always just quick to say whatever comes to our minds. And we don't take a minute to even contemplate what will that word or what will those words do to whoever we're talking to. And it could be, um, you know, like Pauline was talking about, will it add fruit? Will we leave fruit behind? So when we are speaking to our, you know, husband or wives, or are we speaking to our children? Are we speaking life into them? And we, you know, um, I know growing up, um, growing up in our culture, we have a lot of little, you know, little things, you know, our, as parents, you know, parents would say. And I think they're just things that were passed down to generations. Um, and we don't realize how if, you know, how effective or how those little words can impact the lives of children and how can it affect our mindset. And I believe that um, our words are very powerful and it could be the simplest of words. Even telling, you know, children, you're, you know, you're a dummy or, you know, you're, you're so stupid. Or, you know, instead of, no, that was not the best choice. Or I would do that differently. You know, so our choice of words, um, I believe, is very impactful. Um, even when we're speaking to people about sickness, um, you know, we all go to the the verse or the scripture that talks about, you know, the power of Jesus as our healer. And we say, by his stripes, we are healed. Do we even know as human, you know, as hum in humanity, do we even know what that even means? That when we speak that, we have authority to speak life into each other. And so... I recall when, you know, the Lord was ascending into, um, when he was ascending into heaven, when he was with his apostles, he said those words. He said, I leave with you my authority. You will do greater things than I have done. And so I always think about that because I believe that if I'm speaking healing into someone, then it a done deal because Christ said it's done and so anyway so that just really um, is a powerful scripture to me um, to remind each other how impactful our words are um, the tongue you know you know talking about um, when the tongue said when the word says that you know the tongue can be also death um, are we speaking you know don't do that because you're going to fall down and hurt yourself. Or, you know, you're going to fall and scrape your knee. Well, you already spoke it in, spoke it into them. So, you know, um, it, it's just so important to be mindful. Um, don't do that. Or, you know, gosh, you, you're, you're so foolish or you're so stupid. You're going to fail. And, you know, I just really have started, I had to learn. I learned. Um, I feel like the Lord prompted me um, to learn how to speak to my children, 
I'll just speak to my family members, to my friends. Um, even at work, um, managing employees, um, how do I encourage them? How do I speak life into them so that whatever they do um, will be a reflection of us as a team? And how do I help them to succeed and accomplish goals? Um, how do I lead them, you know, in a righteous way, um, in respect? How do I change the culture around me? How do I change the atmosphere of my home? How do I change the atmosphere of my relationship with my sister or my neighbor? Or how do I change all those, you know, different aspects of my life? Um, I was listening to a presentation this morning and um, our Secretary of State was um, a guest speaker and she was talking about different, you know, different issues she was addressing. But one of, but the one quote she said that really, really stood out for me was she said, um, we all can make a difference, but we speak a lot of what we can do but we don't always act and we don't go ahead and actually make a step to act on it. And so I thought about that a lot and I was sharing this with my team and I said, um, you know, I thought about it and I said, you know, um, I can act on it by just being impacting my surroundings. Um, how do I interact with my children, my family members? Do I speak with pe to people with respect? Um, even if it's something that makes me angry or annoyed, can I speak and have a conversation about it um, without being offensive? Um, how can I make a difference in the little everyday things that I do? So I just think, you know, our speech is so important. Um, we're just so quick to speak um, instead of even just taking the time to just sometimes be quiet. We don't always have to say anything. Um, sometimes the most impactful things that we do is actually in silence. It's how we carry ourselves and how we interact Maybe it's a gesture. Um, maybe it's someone we disagree with, but we don't have to let them know right away we disagree with them. We can just be quiet and have peace. We don't have to disrupt the peace around us. You know, so um, I'm all about peace. I love to be in peace. And when my peace is disrupted and there's confusion, then I know that there is a change or there's something that I could be doing differently. And I don't look towards the other person um, as the human, you know, as a person, we tend to want to look at the other person um, to say, well, they influenced it. But you know what? I believe that I don't even have to be offended. I don't have to receive offenses from someone else's disruption or from what, sometimes it's not the time to say anything. It's not the time to speak. Sometimes we have something really good to say or something that we think is very important but sometimes, you know, um, the Holy Spirit will say, uh-uh, it's not time yet. Be quiet and um, be still. And then he'll give the time, and, you know. So um, I just really, um, the message I just believe is um, really about what we say, how we say things. Are we going to change atmospheres? Um, and I want you to know um, from my own experience, my own walk with the Lord, 
the only way that I've been able to even try and even try to even succeed or accomplish anything from the word um, is spending the time with the Lord. Um, the word says that, you know, we, he wants us to find our secret place where we would meet with him. And it's the only way to really learn um, his ways. Um, when I spend time with my family, when I spend time with my children, um, we get to know each other. Um, if I'm away from a friend or even a family member for months or even years, um, we tend to have, you know, you start becoming distanced and then you start kind of forgetting each other's ways. But the more you spend with each other, the more you start knowing each other and understanding each other. And so that's the same with the Lord. The more we spend time with him alone in that secret place, he's, he's right here, right there with us. Just talk to him as we're talking to each other right now. And then we become more like him. The word said that we're made in his image. And so we definitely would, the more we know who he is, who, what his image consists of, what does he, com what is he about? Then the more we become more like him and the way is by being in his presence and getting to know him and learn about him. And then it becomes easier because then it's not my way, it's his way. And then we start letting go of the fleshly things that, you know, I used to say, what, what does that mean? What do you mean, like, go the flesh? Go by the flesh. It just means I start relying less on me and my thoughts. And I allow the Holy Spirit and the Lord to lead because he does live in me. He, the Lord, the word says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, that means he's always dwelling in me. He's in me. And so I have him wherever I go. I, he's, he's here. I just, I have to, I just have to allow him to rise up in me and not suppress who he is. And the more we allow him to be a part of our lives, the more he becomes evident in our lives. And then he becomes, um, then we become more like him. And the Lord told me once, um, I was like, you know, I, we always say we, we strive to, we strive as, you know, to do this and do that and be like the Lord. The Lord said, he's already done it. He's like, it is finished. He said that on the cross. He said, you know, he's done it. It's available. We just have to receive it and make a decision that we want to walk in it. And we want to walk in all that the Lord has for us. And so, you know, I just, um, I've learned, I'm still learning, a lot to learn, because the Lord's wisdom is never ending. There is not an end. He is infinitely wise. And there is an abundance in what he has for us. So, we will never have everything here on earth, but we're already champions because the Lord is a champion. He doesn't strive, so he doesn't want us to strive either. He goes thrive, T-H-R-I-V, thrive on what he's already done and what he's accomplished. So um, that's what I've learned in my walk with him. The Lord doesn't want to make it difficult. He makes it easy for us. The word says it all the time. He makes a way. We sing it in songs. He's a way maker. He makes the way. We just need to follow him. And the way I've learned to do that is by being quiet in his presence and listening to him more instead of speaking so much.
Um, and then when I listen, I'm able to, he's able to download all the wisdom um, that I need for whatever he has for me. And then I can go out and be a light and speak life into my family, into my children, to those around me. And um, it's a beautiful walk. It's just amazing. The Lord is all love and he's all peace and he's amazing. Thanks. He is. <laughs> And yeah. you conveyed that so beautifully to us today, Noemi. Thank you for your sharing, and we hope that sometime soon you'll be able to join us back again. Well, I just and want to say, you know, I just want to say quickly, it, it's just, um, it's just really an honor to be with you, woman. You're all amazing, woman, and um, I, I just, I'm just learning a lot from all of you. So thank you for letting me join. Thank you, Noemi. Marky. Hi, Pauline. Thanks. Um, a little prayer. <laughs> no, Noemi, that was a beautiful sharing. Thank you very much. Um, chapter um, 27. Where do I start? Um, the verse that stood out for me most was... Um, verse 30 that said wrath and anger are hateful things yet the sinner hugs them tight and um when i hear this um this whole chapter pretty much is talking about those who have sinned and those who have been um victimized hurt in pain wounded um and it talks about where that takes us both the sinner and the person being wounded. And it's a shame because it, well, let's start with this sinner. It says that um, many sins, it says profits no one, and it's such a struggle. It says that um, you can either be two things, it says in verse three, unless you are earnestly hold fast to the fear of the Lord, suddenly your house will be thrown down. So you have those that are, you have those that are devout, those who hold on to God's word, that when things go awry, when you're being sinned upon, when you are wounded, when you are victimized, when you are hurt, God catches you. God is the one, he is the one that breaks that fall for you. Mm. He says, if you're not in Christ, if you do not follow his word, then your house will be thrown down. We can see that here in these times of COVID. Many people are going in despair and sadness. We're all been shaken. It's an all new walk for all of us. Um, you have many people that are hurting, that are in fear, that are being victimized, being taken advantage of. We have all of that happening right now. Instead of us coming together and holding fast to our Lord and, and having our hope in him and our faith and relying on him. And through him, it allows us to feed each other, support each other, have enough to give to each other. Um, it talks here about wrath and anger, hateful things, yet the sinner hugs them tight. Why do we hold on to things? We who have been victimized hold on so tightly to the hurt and the pain that has um, happened to us. All of a sudden, there's this veil that comes over our face, our eyes, and we're blinded by the rage and the anger and the vengeance and the malice. That you, you're so frustrated and furiated, you cannot see. And the only way you can see is if you hold on to your God. And you allow him to make a way for you to clear that smoke, to clear that fog in your eyes. So you can have, that, have a new light in Christ. These things are not easy to do, but can be done with God. And spoke about it. He says, the only way you can do this is to put your, um, in, is in God's word. 
learning his word. So it is how to forgive and to love someone through these trying times. I'd like to go to um, Psalms 103, and it talks about divine goodness and divine love. It says, bless the Lord, my soul, all my, my beings, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul. Do not forget all the gifts of God who pardons all your sins, heals all your ills, delivers, delivers your life from the pit, surrounds you with love and compassion. Merciful and gracious is the Lord, slow to anger, abounding in kindness. It says, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on the faithful. We cannot do anything without God. It is with his divine goodness, it's with his divine love that we are able to love as well and forgive those who have gone against us, who has broken us, who have caused rage within us. It changes a person. You've seen many people out there who goes to their grave with the sin of anger and rage and frustration because of the brokenness that have been brought upon them. Those who have become victims of horrible things. But how do we live? When we, and then those who live in sin, when we live in sin, most of the time you see people that are sick, can't sleep, are broken, they're, they're, they're ill from sin. But to turn to God and allow him to, to free you from that, to live in that divine love of his and allow him to breathe life in you. And it says it here, you know, you have that pain, you have that brokenness, you know that person from the way they speak, from the way they hurt. You, 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 you meet people in all walks of life. And a lot of times I see somebody frustrating, frustrated, yelling, angry, speaking illly. And I think, gosh, what happened to them? What broke them? What brought them to that point? How can we love them back to some to, to where they, God made us to be. We can't. What we can do, though, is, as you said, Pauline, be fruit. Plant these seeds in them. Love, life, giving in them. But it's for us to learn that ourselves. We need to teach ourselves before we can give that fruit to other people. We need to learn that ourselves. I am as broken as they come. <laughs> Let me tell you, all right? I have had anger and I have raged many a times. I've tapped out of God's life because I'm just too angry to be in it. I'm just so frustrated. But God is a merciful God. He's a loving God and he will never, ever, ever, ever let me go. And he will never, ever, ever let you go either. He will always, always, always be there for you. I think of this song, Living La Vida Loca, upside, inside out, living La Vida Loca, right? <laughs> this is a crazy life we live right now, right? That's what we're, what's happening right now. But we do it with God. We do it with God. As you said, Noemi, he will make a way for you. He will definitely make a way. I would like to end off with this prayer. It's a prayer that I had gotten from a, com a convention um, years ago. And the prayer is prayer of commitment with the word of God. Lord, I believe that your word is life and that is that it generates your life in me. Therefore, I want now to promise to read, meditate, and live your word every day. Give me, Lord, the light of your spirit so that it may reveal your truth in me and transform my heart. And oh, we need God's word to transform us, and to transform our hearts so that we are able to bear fruit for others as well. And that's my sharing. Amen. <laughs> Marky, you really had me choking at one point. I really appreciate <laughs> your, your candidness today and your honesty. So much of us have struggled with these things. But we may not necessarily be honest about it so openly <laughs> to the public. <laughs> you, you, you. you know me as I am, right? <laughs> what you see is what you get. <laughs> and to know me is? 
to love me. <laughs> Thank you, Marie. We saved the best for last today. <laughs> um, yes, um, I really enjoyed um, once again looking at the words of Ben Shira um, as he shared in chapter 27. I think Mark, you did a beautiful summary of the coverings of his teachings today. Um, basically speaking about strife and the destruction of friendships and relationships and showing us that there is only one way really to avoid this lifestyle and taking us to the point where we see if that is not done, then it can actually end up in murder. You know, and so many people, um, you know, wonder why is it that we would sit and discuss the word of God. This morning I was talking to a family um, who is supporting Guadalupe Media and she was saying, you know, um, you guys should have um, counselors. And I was telling her that the Bible is the ultimate counsel. I think you shared it, Naomi, that it has so much wisdom. The wisdom never ends. And when we look at this, I, I never forgot um, a teacher that told me once. He was speaking and delivering a message on tumult. And when I heard that word, it was the very first time I heard the word tumult. T-U-M-U-L-T. And I sat in church listening keenly because this was a new word to me. I mean, I always pay attention. And he shared that this was a sin. And what was the sin with tumult? Tumult was actually speaking to someone in a loud voice, shouting at someone. That is actually a sin. And that is exactly what Ben Shara is outlining here for us today in chapter 27. And it's a sin that we see all around us. I am a Belize city girl and... You know, as you move around the city, so many people communicate that way. And sometimes we're talking to somebody right beside us and you wonder, why would you show? I, I remember when I was 19, I got interviewed at um, BTL. And there were three or four people interviewing me on the panel and they said, what is your pet peeve? And I said, if you speak to me and you raise your voice, I will cry. <laughs> I was only 19. <laughs> But it was the truth. If you speak to me and you speak in a harsh way, it can bring me to tears. But looking at this discourse here today, um, I wondered why do people shout? And this person that was teaching shared the reason why someone shouts is because they feel that they are far away from you. And I have never forgotten that. And so whenever I'm in a discussion or I'm talking to somebody or sometimes, you know, you're having these difficult conversations and somebody would raise their voice, I recognize that distance. Actually, I have a daughter, uh, my eldest child, who is adopted. And that has been the nature of our relationship. Um, whenever we are having these conversations, she tends to raise her voice. And I know that it's because she feels distant. And so our relationship has been more to build back that bridge because I adopted her, she has had difficulty struggling with that intimacy that we are born for. We are born for it. And that is why you see people clamoring for it in relationships. People are shouting and they're in the same room. Because it's important for us to feel that intimacy. It's important. And you say, well, why? What causes that? Why do people do that? You can say to somebody... You don't have to shout. I've said that so many times to my daughter. You don't have to shout. You can just talk to me. I'm right here. But understanding what causes it, I understand. And so it takes patience. But where does it come from? 
when Shara tells you. In fact, we've been leading up to this chapter because before this, he was covering the discourse between man and woman and the, the struggles that they face. But he actually outlines it right here in chapter 16. He says, whoever, whoever betrays, destroys confidence. All of us want that confidence in our relationships. All of us need that confidence. When do we raise our voice in our marriages? When we think our husband went somewhere else and he wasn't supposed to be there and trust is eroded. When do we raise our voices with our children? When we think they lied to us and they probably didn't come straight home from school and they were somewhere that they shouldn't have been. It goes deeper than that. When relationships are broken and we have to interact with those persons and life goes on, but we're not healed, then the raising of the voice comes up because of the distance. And I suffered from that too when I was younger because my biological dad, like I shared here, he left before I wasn't even born. And so I really struggled with feeling that confidence. But there is an answer and that's why the Bible is the ultimate wisdom because it's not just say, sharing Oh, don't do this, don't do that. God understands what is the plight. He designed us, he created us. He knows the intimacy that we need. And so he comes down to us and he meets us where we are as our father, our intimate and loving father. Let me tell you, I have searched high and low for that intimacy and I found it in him. In him alone. In him alone. He alone comforts. He alone gives wisdom. He alone provides exactly what we need. And so now I am able to pour out. And over time I've seen where my daughter finally is coming into the place. And she's 24 already. Coming into the place where she's understanding you know what, maybe you won't leave me. Maybe you won't abandon me too. Maybe you will stay for the long haul. We yearn for that, our souls yearn for it. The persons out there that you hear quarreling and striving, it's not because they want to quarrel, it's because of the distance. And so now, even in my approach, if somebody starts shouting, it's to talk them down. It's to be patient. It's to be that sanctuary that brings shade. It's to let people know that they're safe. They're safe. That same safety that I received from God Almighty, that same safety I want to share you know, and the first order of business for me as a single mom is for my kids. I have three children and it bothers me every day that my eldest still feels unsure at 24. That is the destruction that caused that, caused that birth. The same destruction that came to me. And the only place I found hope, the only place I found that intimacy was in Christ. He was able to redeem me. And because I experienced it, I am sure he will do it for my daughter. And I'm sure he will do it for others. And so I'm thankful for Ben Shira once again for sharing such wisdom with us. Um, the whole idea of tumult, the shouting, is a place for healing. And there is really only one place we can go for that healing. And that is the cross. That's my sharing. Thank you, Marie. Beautiful. And you know, this is a culture thing too. 
Um, yeah, and it's faster. It's, it's a learned behavior. So we got to keep praying for healing in our nation and healing for each other. Amen. With that, we want to thank you for joining us today for Be Still My Soul. And we now invite you to join us for a closing prayer. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who wander throughout the world, seeking the ruins of souls. Amen. Amen. Amen.